I know I just bought my Mercedes in April, but I just bought another car. What is happening folks, my name is Robbie and today I'm going to be telling you all about my new side hustle. Now I have spoken before on the fact that I hate the term side hustle and I hate that for three reasons. Number one, I hate when people Americanize things for no reason. If you don't use the word hustle in your day to day vocabulary, don't use it now just because Gary V calls it a side hustle. Hustle is the most important word ever. For hustling, hustle and hustle your face off and then hustle your face off. Hustle is putting it all on the line. The hustle, stop crying and just keep hustling. Number two, the term hustle typically implies that something is disingenuous, like you're stealing from people or scamming people. Everything you need to know about joining the Hustlers University program. And number three, if you're starting a business venture of some sort, even if it is on the side from your full-time job, calling it a side hustle typically means you're not gonna put as much effort into it because it's something on the side rather than a main hustle, if you like. Call it what it is, it's a business. So. Why have I called this video my £1,000 per month side hustle if I don't like the term side hustle? Because I'm a hypocrite and the term side hustle will definitely get more views than my little part-time business. Anyway, let's get on to the actual matter at hand. So if you'd seen my previous videos, you'll know that I recently got rid of my Audi S3 and purchased a Mercedes C200. Absolutely love it. Comfy, economical, nice to look at, maybe could be very slightly quicker, but all in all, it's a good car. However, on the same day that I paid my deposit for the Mercedes, I also picked up another car. I now have a two car garage, technically speaking at least. It's maybe not to the standard of Yanni from Yanomai's, TGE, the Hamilton collection, Stradman, but it's definitely two cars and they definitely both have my name on the V5. So this is my other new car, 2012 BMW 520D, a big old boat of a car. So why did I buy a BMW on the same day that I bought my Mercedes? Cash, for cash flow. So this car is an investment, I'm not using it as a mode of transport and I know typically a car is not an investment because it's a depreciating asset but let me give you a bit of backstory. My dad's a taxi driver or a private hire driver to be more specific. Basically means you can't flag him down and he can't pick you up at the side of the road if you need a taxi. You need to phone it and book it. He's been a private hire driver for years, but the business model of taxis and private hire cars is someone needs to own the car obviously. Either the driver owns the car and drives it himself, or someone else owns the car and other people drive it. Or the third option, someone owns the car, drives it one shift and has another driver just for the other shift. In my dad's case, he drives a car that someone else owns and he gets a set percentage of every fare he takes. And then the owner of the car gets the remainder. So my dad spoke about putting his own car on the road for years, but it was just never something he really got round to. I think he liked the idea of getting his own car on the road, but was also quite happy just plodding along working for this other guy. And the other guy treated him well. There was no problems with working for the other guy. I think he just wanted to be able to work completely for himself instead. So I proposed to him that we could partner up. I'd buy a car, get the meter installed, put it through its MOT, make sure it's up to scratch for taking passengers, and my dad would drive it. This way we both benefit. He still gets all of his shares that he usually would, but he'll also get a portion of the profit that the car generates as well. And I get a little extra income, just as a return on my investment, and in taking care of the money on the back end, speaking to an accountant, making sure everything's done correctly. So the car isn't at my house just now, because it's out on the road being put to work. So I can't give you a little walk around, I only have a few pictures, but let's be serious, you're not here about the car itself, you're here to hear about the money. So first and foremost, how much did it cost to get started? Initially we weren't looking for a BMW, we were looking for just about anything that would fit the criteria for a private hire car. And I found all this information on the local council's website, basically listing out the criteria for a private hire car. It has to have a certain boot capacity, it has to have four passenger seats, the passenger seats need to be a certain width, there are certain rules on the emissions that the car produces. So we had been looking for a few weeks, but the used car market was a bit crazy at the time. But we stumbled upon this car through a mutual friend and we got a good deal on it. The car cost us £5,000, which was a decent deal, as there were a few examples on Autotrader going for as much as 6500 albeit they did have slightly less miles. In the property world, we call this a below market value deal. Properties heavily below market value. So, we got the car BMV, and then we had to get to work making sure it was up to scratch to be put on the road. Because I've never owned a taxi, I had no idea what this entailed. Naively, I presumed you pretty much stick it through an MOT for 50 quid, pay maybe £100 to the council to get the licence, and you're good to go. Wrong. I'll stick a little counter here in the corner to total up how much the car actually cost to be put on the road. So, £5,000 for the BMW BMW. We then had to pay the council their fee for getting the car tested and licensed. £444.78. 
about four times as much as I was expecting it to be. At this point I heard from numerous taxi drivers. I play poker every week and for some reason like 20 people that play poker at that pub are taxi drivers so I speak to a lot of them. That apparently the testing process is notoriously picky and could fail on something that a normal MOT would pass. So as an added precaution, I took the car to a garage to get a full service in MOT just to make sure that everything was perfect. So that was £219. Then I had to get a fire extinguisher, a tyre inflation kit and some very specific no smoking stickers for the window. Fire extinguisher was £17.99, stickers were £8.09 and the tyre inflation kit was £25.30. Thought I might as well get a decent one that has some of that foam stuff that goes in the tyre. Probably could have got a cheaper one to be honest. Then I actually found a tyre inflation kit in the storage area underneath the boot. Anyway, so now it was just time to get the car valeted and get it put through its test. Full valet on the car, 60 quid. So after weeks of planning, looking for cars, getting the car ready to go, my dad also went on holiday for a week in between so then that added an extra delay, we had finally got to test it. The car was immaculate, everything was in place to have the car on the road by the weekend. Then we failed. Apparently, and I've looked on the council's website and I can't see it anywhere, a private hire car is not allowed to have a tow bar for whatever reason. No one seemed to be able to give me a reason for that, but that's the rules. So we were sent on our way with a sheet of paper instructing us to have the tow bar and the electrics for it removed and that the windscreen was disgusting. There was some condensation on the inside of the window apparently. Turns out people were right when they said they can be a bit picky. So it was back to the drawing board to find out how big a job it is and how expensive it is to have a tow bar removed. After speaking to a handful of mechanics, we eventually found a friend of a friend who was quite happy to do it for 50 quid. I know, I couldn't believe it either. But all that glitters is not gold. After the tow bar was removed, my dad was driving out the street and some warning lights started flashing up on the dashboard, stating that the rear lights weren't working anymore. Apparently the mechanic never went near the rear lights so it couldn't have been his fault, but whatever, it wasn't worth the argument. Managed to get a hold of an auto electrician and he sorted it for another 50 quid. So a week later, we were back in for a test, which is free if you get retested within two weeks I believe. Finally, the car is in for its test, the tow bar is gone, we can finally start making money from this thing. Failed. Again. Turns out, the electrics for the tow bar were not removed. They were just tied up and stuffed up inside the car. Back to the auto electrician again to make sure the wiring was disconnected correctly. Another 50 quid. A few days later, back into the test centre and it was done. The car passed and we were finally able to get it on the road. Again, due to my naivety, I presumed there really wouldn't be any more expenses. Wrong again. Turns out insurance for a private hire car is a lot less simple to acquire than for your own car. Three different companies didn't even call back after giving us a quote. But we finally found one and we paid the £340.64 for the deposit. And yes, I could have paid this in one go rather than paying it monthly. But I was already six grand deep at this point, so I just decided that monthly payments was better. Question, have you ever got a taxi that doesn't have a meter on the dashboard? Of course you haven't. Meter installation, 285 quid. And how many times have you gotten a taxi and wanted to pay by card? In this day and age, probably quite often. Card reader, 20 quid. And the fares have got to come from somewhere. People don't magically just acquire your phone number and phone you asking for a lift. You need to pay an operator a weekly fee to be on their system. This was £75 for a partial week because we were put on the system in the middle of the week. But how does the company send you these fares? Well, of course, you can't just use your personal phone number. You've got to have a dedicated phone to receive these fares. £130. Quid. And the final expense for the car? Little adhesive strips from Halfords to attach the private hire number plates to the car. So we have our total startup cost. £6,706 pound and 68 pence. But how much money will the car generate and how much do I stand to make? So the way that private hire cars work, as far as my knowledge goes at least, is similar to how a barber shop or a tattoo studio might work. In the case of a tattooist, you bring your own clients, do your own advertising on social media, and whatever you make from tattooing, the studio will take a percentage of that amount. Could be 50-50, could be 60-40. It's all circumstantial on how good you are at negotiating. Also, this obviously isn't how all tattoo studios work, but it's how some do. So the same goes for being a driver. Let's say you make £100 in a night. Depending on what you've negotiated with the car owner, you might give them £50 of the 100 that you've made, if it's a 50-50 split. Or you might give them 45 and you keep 50 these numbers obviously just depend on what you might have negotiated. So in this instance, my dad will take his proportion of the fares every night, just the same way he did with the previous car, and then the remaining percentage will go into a separate bank account dedicated to the running costs of the car and the income that the car receives. 
Then at the end of the month, we can take whatever's in the bank account and split it between us. Obviously the downside to owning the car instead of driving someone else's is you have to take maintenance into account, new tires, insurance, fuel, all this comes out of your pocket which of course eats into your profit. So after taking all of this into account, with another driver working on the opposite shift of my dad, so the car's on the road most of the time, I expect the car to generate roughly £1,600 to £2,000 per month. This can obviously fluctuate depending on fuel prices, breakdowns and general maintenance. So I can't give a definitive number just now, but that's the ballpark figure that we're aiming for. Splitting that in half for my cut, I'll be looking at between 800 and 1000 pounds per month. So what does that mean for my return on investment? Now this is the return on investment for me, not in total. Because I've put in the seed capital to buy the car and get it on the road, then we're splitting it 50-50. So we take the monthly income that I will make and multiply that by 12. So on the low end, that'll be 9,600 pounds and on the high end, 12,000 pounds. Then we take that number and divide it by the original investment of 6,706 pound and 78 pence and multiply that by 100. That gives me a return on investment of 143% on the low end and 179% on the high end. This means that in a year, the car will have paid for itself and also provided an extra 43% on top of that. That's a very decent return. I actually wish I could have invested more money to get that return. Now, will these numbers stand the test of time? Who knows? I'm new to this and I have no idea what sort of issues might arise. So I'm gonna let it run its course for a full year and see what the actual return will be compared to my rough numbers here. If you're interested in how this performs over the long term, make sure to leave a comment and let me know and I'll make a video again this time next year going through the actual numbers compared to what I was hoping for. Until then, if you ever need a lift anywhere in the West Lothian area, shoot me a message on Instagram and I'll sort you out. Thank you as always for watching folks and I will see you next week. Take it easy.